As you can see, between May 29 and December 11, it's exactly 196 days. Of course, expectations are still very, very high. We have with us, so we don't uh, keep you waiting for too long, the governor of Lagos State. We call him Mr. Governor, Mr. Babajide Fashala. Did I say Babajide Fashala? Babajide Sowul. Thank you. That's okay, Ayo. It's okay. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, so, for having me. 196 and days in the saddle. Uh, how's it been? Well, it's been roller coaster. I mean, it's been, it's been first, it's been a whole lot of um, humbling experience. It's been in a whole lot of um, reality um, check for me. Um, it's, been, it's been very engaging. You know, Lagosians has been extremely, thoroughly very engaging. It's been very engaging, very um, inspirational, right? But more importantly, right, um, it further just confirms, right, that it could be done. That in the midst of all of the challenges, solutions can um, be exposed, you know, and deliverables can be met, right? Um, it's 196 days, like you said, out of 1,460 days, right? So we're counting on a daily basis, right? So we've done about 13.4% of our time, right? So, and I said to my team, right, um, we don't need to wait until four years before we know what kind of scorecard we have out there for Lagosians. So on a daily basis, keep asking yourself, what have you done in your eight to 10 hour serving Lagosians? What are the ideas that you have brought on board that can improve the quality of life of Lagosians? What are the challenges that you see on your way to office, on your way back home, that you think we can bring about to solve all of the solutions, to improve life, to improve the standard of living, and to further improve the quality of people living in Lagos State, to make the business environment a lot better. And those are the questions we're asking ourselves on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So um, recently also you said that there's a difference between the information you have before you get into the office and the information you have after. Was there a, a culture shock of sorts? Certainly not. Certainly, in terms of culture, I've been, I've been privileged to work in service. Right? It will probably be in the realities of numbers. Right. Um, if you sit right there, if you sit down, there are specific things you can ask for and you will see. Right. From outside, you can only make a guess. From outside, you can only just, you know, um, make an assumption. Right. And you also don't know the reasons behind some of the figures or some of the things that you hear. Right. And, and it's only when you are there that you can speak. And I tell you one or two. Right. I mean, if you are not the governor, you certainly cannot sit in a security meeting. Right? And if you're not in a security meeting, you will not hear things about security. You will not know what are the challenges, you know, or what are the solutions that need to be brought to your table for you to solve those security issues. Right? So you will, you will certainly never have that opportunity unless you are there. Now, yes. Now that you bring up security, I mean, I think it's a great place to start. Okay. If you randomly Google Lagos State, yeah. you'll find results. Is Lagos State safe? Okay. I mean... You could just do it right now. You find other results like, is wish, Lagos a good I place? I, <laughs> I know, is Lagos a good place to yeah. leave? Apparently, that's a major concern yeah. for people. And it's, it's normal. If you yeah. want to go to a place, you want to expect that the place is safe. Now, there have been a lot of talk about security. Just a few days ago, a young lady was, was killed. She was mugged and then she was stabbed eventually. And she was taken to the hospital. I'm not sure you saw that story around Bagada. And this is something you find around places in Lagos. So security-wise, now that you've brought it up, how are we doing in Lagos? Well, we're doing, you know, first thing is um, at a period like this, going to end of, you know, uh, the year, it's usually hypes a bit up. The, the spikes usually goes up. And we know that, you know, from trend, people usually just want to do a lot of sharp corners. You know, people just want to make a few more monies before the end of year. So very typically. Right, so we, we are truly, really tracking, you know, that. Um, the incident that you mentioned, incidentally, I'm on top of it. I know the lady, incidentally, he works with a company um, that I know, I mean, who are the people that are running the company. So very, very unfortunate, extremely unfortunate. In fact, I got to know about that that same night, right, when the thing happened and we've done. In fact, at our ad tech exhibition um, conference that we had on Friday, we actually took a minute silence, you know, um, because she was working as a volunteer on that um, art technology um, seminar that we held um, last week in, at, at, the, at the Oriental Hotel. Very unfortunate, but what are we doing? What are the things that we're doing? Fine, we have a brand new um, commission of police who had actually hit the ground running you know, from the very first day it came in. You also heard about the very unfortunate incident 
uh, of an expatriate that was also, you know, stabbed by domestic staff about two days ago. I was up till 2 a.m. last Saturday when the incident, I was up till 2 a.m. Because we're tracking the incident and the commissioner of police himself led the team, you know, into that premises and were able to apprehend you know, the two suspects, you know, it was a massive compound. They had finished what they wanted to do. They had gone on hiding, right? And the commissioner, and I said to him, you do not leave that side until when we get, you know, suspects. And at the end of the day, we're able to get suspects. You know, policing and security comes with two ways. It comes with intelligence, you know, what kind of information do you have prior or even after, right? Because it's always an issue. You, you really don't know who has a criminal tendency just by looking at the face. It's never written on the forehead that somebody is carrying a gun or is carrying it. So really, it has to be that we have more men out there on the street and we must have ability to be able to respond when there's a distress call. And so that's why you see with the security trust fund, we keep increasing the number of vehicles we have to provide for them. We keep supporting them with all of communication gadgets. We keep saying to them that whatever you need, you require to be able to respond when the distress to come, which we don't know when it will come, you must be able to live to it. So, you know, when you're doing the analysis, it will be a function of what is your response time, how well are you also able to track or to investigate and get perpetrators of this so that you can send a very strong signal to it. You know, just to also digress a little bit, one of the things that we realize that is happening everywhere in the world is that security is also going tech. You know, you need a lot of technology, you need a lot of devices to be able to monitor it. And so whilst we're doing all of the very hard things you're seeing, we're also building it up tech. So next year, right, we're building what we'll call a, control, a new control and command center as part of our safe city project, as part of our, you know, um, mega city, you know, security deliverables. And what will we be doing? You know, all of the things you see in developed nations where we're going to be installing at the first phase of it about 2,200, you know, high division cameras all around, you know, places in, in, in the state where, you know, from a control and command center, we can view, we can review, and they can also monitor and track, you know, incidents, you know, as, as they do occur. You know, also improve communication gadgets, right? Have them all speak around the city and the state where people can communicate and they can, you know, know that this is, you know, a response, this is how we need to, to, to do it. And training, right. you know, with the security officials that are there, you know, and those are some of the things that will happen in the first quarter next year. Mr. Governor, uh, still on security, now that you've talked about, you know, the plan to yeah. deploy technology to uh, monitor and track security threats. Well, there is a security threat that's been raised by a viewer now um, who just sent this in, Olaj Shubomi Odonsi, who says that we should ask why government in, uh, in Lagos is allowing uh, major roads in highbrow VI, EGS, Samuel Manua, 1004 entrance gate, and Adetokumba Ademola to become Kekemarua Pass, where the operators sleep on the roads and food and paraga vendors occupy the sidewalks. This is a concern because, uh, just as you said, we don't know who has criminal tendencies. And if these people continue to mill around the roads and no one is uh, there to check them, I'm, I'm positive this it will definitely break your heart to see that. Kind well, of I mean, you so, so, so these are the things, you know. So a lot of people come into Lagos and they really don't even have a place they do not have a means. They don't know where the next meal is going to come from. They do not know, you know, where they're going to sleep. And that's the reality. We get this every day. Thousands of people come into the city without plan, without anything. You, you know it, right? And we do not have any border control to, to also, I mean, um, stop or mitigate this, right? So these are some of the things that we see. So we go around. I've gotten calls from different parts of the, of the country. I've gotten calls in which... We, we, we go around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. to ask, why are you under the bridge? Why are you packed, you know, and sleeping here? They do not have where to go to. Is there any way to mitigate this? Well, I mean, what, what other means of mitigation can we accept for us to, to say to ourselves, we need, just need to continue to provide a means of livelihood for people? It's, it's a huge challenge, right? Whilst the person is talking about there's a, there's a police, there's a, there's, there's a security van at that junction, which is called a pinpoint you know, right in front of the exit gate or the entry gate of, of 1,000. One so I know where that is, mm. right? So we go there, we, we smoke these people out, right? The very next day or something, they are back there again. 
uh, pardon me. Coded. Which which also brings up the, the the issue of shanties, you know, all over the place. You know, just as you said, if some of these people are not able to find a place, they will just look at the next available place. Uh, you know, shanties, you know, in various parts Spring of the up city, everywhere. springing up everywhere, but especially uh, also consider the beach fronts. Well, uh, that's probably a, a tourism interest for you. We'll, we'll get there. But then the concern that these beach fronts are, you know, are appalling in their sight and the shanties are, are springing, springing up all up. over the place. You know, we know that, you know, in years gone by, governments in Lagos at various levels, and even the federal government, had tried to mitigate this. You know, the Morocco example is one that they, they took. You know, what some people consider draconian uh, action to to mitigate that. Is there any plan to? Because I know it's part of the things that you are interested. Well, in. Well, essentially, is to do you know a lot of what we we'll call um, regeneration, right? So um, I watched a documentary on your channel yesterday. Right, and immediately we also spawn into action, right? So this was a right of way, right, um, that we're, we're preserving for future development of road, which we call the coastal road, right? So it's been, it's been set at about 60, 80 meters of right of way just to preserve that corridor so that we do not have people building, you know, and to, to disrupt the future development in that whole corridor. And before you, you wake up, you know, people started erecting all sort of makeshift shanties, you know, into it, right? So we're going there again this morning to serve them contravention. But the flip side of it, too, is that, um, you know, you have NGOs, too, that will also say to you that you also cannot displace them. You also cannot remove them. So these are conversations we keep having, right? At what point in time do we need to also manage this population explosion? Lagos is growing at a level that is even higher than the national average. Right. And at, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, right, it's also because people feel and believe that they could get, you know, a better means of livelihood down here. Right. So we want to be able to provide those facilities. We want to be able to, to give them that opportunity as Nigerians, as all of us, right. But the truth about it is that the government cannot do it alone. So we need to continue to engage also with the private sector to see how we continue to provide job opportunity for them, skill acquisition, even as little as we go in there to do enumeration for them. They all want to take a run. Right. And we said, if we don't do enumeration, if we don't know who you are, where you've come from, how long you've been here, we can also not plan. But they run away. That, that's definitely a concern. You know? But, but th th definitely there is a, pro there, there is a solution, right? We, we certainly need to have a solution. So we have a lastra which was said to people that freely come and also register, right, at any of our local government, so that we can, once we know the demography of different areas, right, our planning, our future planning also will improve. What are the things we need to provide for some of those things, okay. you know, for some of these areas? Okay. You know, but once you get there, everybody just runs away helter-skelter. We certainly cannot come at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. and say that we want to take a remuneration, we want to take an enumeration of how many of you are actually living or sleeping here. Could it be in the way it was being, it's being communicated to them? Because if they do, just as you said once, if they do not, if people need to take ownership of whatever policy of government there is. So maybe there is a way that we need to communicate with them to let them know that it's, we're not trying to drive you out of town. It's just to Essentially, better for you. So, so, so we're, we're, we're in a station now. <laughs> so you also help. You're also part of it, you know. So let's also use, you know, whatever arms, you know, that we can use to further reinforce the communication. So one of the things that we will do, living here too, is to see if we can also produce a lot of also further, you know, leaflets to go paste and say, come to Lastra, come to, and we've got them in over 300 locations. Mm. Come and register. So, so, sorry, Carl, you're still talking about chances. There's this uh, report that was done. Uh, the question is in the report. Let's take a look at it. Coastal Road in the Lekki area of Lagos State boasts of several estates and streets bordering it, including Okunde Blue Scheme, Adedeji Close, Oriwo, Odubiyi, Falasha Deawe, Remi, Oluwude Streets, and more. There is also the presence of some squatters that have become a source of hazardous and security threats to others in the neighborhood. They live in shanties and wooden buildings. This overhead shot of the area gives an indication of how much they've grown and taken root. On a daily basis, more people join them 
and they sometimes lead to a rivalry between different gangs and fighting. Some of the residents whose faces are blurred for fear of their safety speak on the harrowing problems they've had to put up with in the light of the overwhelming presence of the squatters. I've been living here for close to a year now and um, I would say that it's been one year of hell. Uh, first is the offensive odor which is coming from uh, right behind us on the coastal road which um, I would say has been abandoned or is an abandoned project. We have people living there, living in shanties and uh, defecating right on, uh, on the road which is in the right, directly behind where we live. The smell, the urine and part, all the rubbish and the depth, the garbage from the whole of Lekki is being dumped here. It's now a dump site. We want, I don't know, um, government to do something about it. It's really, really affecting us. Our children can't play outside. Uh, you know, we can't even enjoy the beauty of nature again. We are always indoors. We are always because of this tent. While it may be an eyesore to watch such settlement in the Hybra area of Lagos blossom, it will make a lot of impact if the government does not only displace them, but also find ways of resettling them. Mr. Governor. Well, that was the report that I told you about. Oh. I also watched it yesterday mm -hmm. while it was being shown. And like you said, if you see, it's a stretch, it's a right of way. It's an 80 to 90 meter right of way which you are preserving for the coastal road. It hasn't been constructed, it will be constructed. It's part of our PPP plans to be able to raise private equity to build it. It starts right from Kuram waters and goes straight parallel to the um, Atlantic Ocean. It could go as far as um, the Lekki Free Trade Zone. So it's, it's a road that we're preserving. and So it's a right of way that we're preserving just to have future development. If you also monitor, about a week ago, I, go, I went on another one, which we call the regional road. On the regional road, it's by, from VGC, right to the Freedom Road, right? So what has happened in that other right of way is also people have started building on the right of, and you will see it. It's a corridor that has been preserved for development, right? And sometimes you see people that are also well-schooled, that are also well-educated, building on government right of way where it's been properly gazetted as a future development. The ones you've shown now, right, which is very unfortunate, right, which were have gone there yesterday, because I called into your studio yesterday when I saw it, right, and the tax flow is also there again, right. You said, so it's a chicken and egg thing. In your report, you said I should resettle them. To where? To, to where, you know, would you put squalor? So we're going to take them out. We're going to give a one-week notice, which is a mandatory, but we're going to take them out. Mm -hmm. And we're going to invite you to come and see, right, because... That is a development that we need to preserve. We may not have all of the funding today, but we cannot allow to overbuild. If you don't do in your master plan, that's why you have master plan. In your master plan, you have roads that will come up as development do happen. And that's why we preserve that. If not, proper buildings will have been there. So these are all shanties, right? And we're just going to take it out. And we're just going to clean it up. Now that you bring up the master plan, I remember the last time you were here, you mentioned some pillars. You talked about traffic management, health and environment. And in that report, I'm, I'm sure you saw the heaps of refuse, which is a major concern yeah. in Lagos. And that was one of the things you actually talked about. You were actually seated here. I'm sure you remember uh, that day. So let's talk about waste management in Lagos. I know we have dump sites. Some of them complained about these dump sites in this report. What is the plan for effective waste management in Lagos? Well, thank you very much. Um, Lagos also, so we generate between 8,000 to 9,000 metric tons of waste every day. That's a lot. That's a lot of waste to generate. And we've got four dump sites, you know, that two of them are almost filled up as we speak now. So two are fairly out of city, but we're trying to wrap up even road connection, you know, to, to those dump sites. How do you, and you know, in our plan where we, when we started, we said for waste to be, um, to leave the street and for you to see the end of naked weights, we needed to do what we call waste sorting from the resident. We launched a program about three months ago, which we call Blue Box, you know, um, um, Blue Box Waste Initiative, which is where we're handling and we're giving out um, waste bags, you know, from the tournament, different colors, purple bag, blue bag, and yellow bags. We're giving it to residents free of charge where they can put their waste. That is getting a lot of traction. We imagine that it's been, it's been, it's been, a lot better than what it was six, 
seven months ago. I mean, that, and that's the truth. We've cleaned up the entire highways of, of waste, you know, um, naked waste. You know, we've cleaned up a lot of internal roads. We've just procured another 20,000 of the, one, one, the 150 litre um, um, waste bags, um, waste um, boxes that are, that, that are in front of houses, and they've started deploying them. Right. One of the conditions of getting one is that you certainly must be paying, you know, um, your tenement rate or something, and they will give you one free of charge. So we have actually started that. But what is the medium to long term solution? So we started waste, um, giving, giving waste bags to residents so that they don't have naked waste. One of the solutions is that we're also revamping what we call the transfer loading station at Simpson, at um, Oshodi, and another one at Agege. Right, so we're, 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 we're revamping them. So we're also improving, you know, our ability to have waste conversion. A lot of people have sent proposals to us that say they can do waste to energy, they can do waste to fertilizer, they can do... Yes, we've seen it, right? But the bottom line also is that it requires some level of investment. On my trip to China, it was also one of the things that I took back, where one or two companies says that they also can come here. So how it will work is that you need to also provide for them a big land area, right, which where the waste had to be sorted. You know, for you to be able to use the waste to whatever it is you want to take it to, be it energy, be it fertilizer, sorting must have been done. And the sorting and should, should start come from, from the, the homes, kitchen. Right? It must start from the kitchen. That's what makes it a lot easier on the investor to want to take it. Because if not, it increases the cost of the investment by about 20 to 30 percent. Because if you now need to sort, you know, it will not make it competitive. And if it's not competitive, the investor will certainly not be willing to make those investments. So waste sorting is one of the things first that we need to get around. And it's the culture thing, right? So a lot of advocacy has to go there. A lot of, you know, talk. We've taken it to, to, to our schools. Mm. We've taken it to primary schools. We've taken it to secondary schools. So that is where the foundation needs to start from. Children need to take this conversation home and tell and remind their parents. That, see, we've just finished eating. Let us even sort this thing. So, so let's, let's go over the sorting, yes. the colors of the bags and yeah. what you put so, in there. Yeah, so, so in different colors, there are some we call the, the proper, you know, black, um, which are the organic waste, right. which are the food in itself. Okay. The purple ones will be the, the bottles, you know, and, and the plastics. And the, the orange one, I think, we have are the paper, um, 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 waste paper or cardboard or anything. You know, so once you have bottles, you have uh, cans, in one, you have your organic waste, which is uh, your real food um, waste. The perishables. Yeah. Perishables in another one. Then you have the last one, which will be like for papers and things. Once you do all those three kind of companies, there are people that will just come and pick the cans and the bottles. That's awesome. There are people that will be interested, you know, in, in, in the organic waste. There are people that will be interested, you know, in your, in your, in your um, used books or, Paper. or papers and all the rest of it. Mr. Governor, I picked a word from this waste that you talked about. You talked about energy. Yeah. Um, it sounds very, very exciting to me. We'll talk about that a little more when we come back from this break, among okay. other issues. Please stay with us. The Chief Executive of Lagos State, uh, Mr. Baba Jide Sanwolo, the governor, is here with us. Uh, so the agenda for this segment is clear, transportation and security. But before we you know, go there, uh, Mr. Governor, uh, you mentioned energy in waste management the other time. Uh, is there any plan to uh, restore the IPP project of Lagos State? Well, th well, thank you very much. Um, ju just for clarity, um, we're the only government um, that currently have six IPP projects, right? So we have Alausa Power, we have Akuti Power, we have Island Power, we have Mainland Power, we have Lekki Power. Um, I can't remember the sixth one. There's six. IPP projects that we have, and I've been in government when we started them. So the whole idea is to see how we wrap up, you know, investment in each and every of those IPPs that we currently have. So a lot of our own state-run um, offices and agencies and a lot of streetlights are on these IPPs, you know. And so the embedded concept that the federal government had just started with the NEC, we had actually taken a lead. I mean, yes, before now. And it's really for us to up it and upscale it and be able to now take it to residents and home beyond just, you know, at government facility. And how are we going to do that? So we're, we have had extensive conversation with the two discos in Lagos, both Eko and Ikeja. And I've said to them, it's very simple, right? 
Um, the concept of willing buyer, willing seller, it's something we need to further enhance and develop. There are other investors that want to come and play in this, in this space, and so you need to either ship it or ship out for them, right? I'm not going to sit back and not be able to give my people power. So part of, the, part of the initiative we're putting together, we actually want to put our skin in the game. We actually want to raise investment for them and see how we can jointly raise and buy and procure maybe um, prepaid meters, because those are some of the things people are talking about. Yeah. That's one. Secondly is to also identify communities that we can ring fence. Right, and they can improve the distribution infrastructure in those communities, you know, and jointly have a tariff structure where we all can discuss and becomes once you can serve, once you can assure them of a 20, a 24 hour minimum power, right, then you can have a tariff structure around them. And it's currently working with one or two locations in Lagos. Okay. Uh Let's, let's talk about um, uh, some other things, roads. Um, you once said earlier in the year that anyone who invited you to anywhere, it will rain. We're happy it hasn't rained today. And it was one of the issues uh, that you raised. You said that the rain was a major in, in, yeah. uh, inhibition to yeah. road construction and all of that. It's definitely a concern for you as well, I, I want to believe, because it's a major concern for many people. Potholes all over the place, heavy traffic as a result of that. Uh, we can't even begin to talk about a proper gridlock and all of that. So how are you taking all these on? Because it's all practically all over the state. I about you will, you will comment and you agree that it's improved in the last two months. So we cannot continue to complain about rain because rain had stopped. Okay. But work has also started, right? And the last month, you know, in the last month or so, We've, like I said, we've awarded over 160 roads. We've awarded additional another 20, right? And these are what we call game changers, right? I was in Ikurudu the other day, you know. So we've started, you know, the, 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 the construction of Agri Kishawa. I went there myself. Agri Kishawa used to have about a, a meter, two kilometer, two meter high of water. It's like a big swimming pool, you know. So the rain has subsided. The rain has gone. And so we've awarded it. It's 7.2 kilometers. That's a game changer. We've awarded Ijede, you know, road that will take you to Itamaru, Iwe Lepe. We've awarded it. It's six point something kilometer. We've awarded Ibugbo, Ishawa Road, um, BAT, also in Ikurudu. It's also a game changer. It's about three point something kilometer. These were some of the relief, right, that we're talking that we're going to come to the Ikurudu access. The Sekumade Ipakodo Road, on which I flew. So I, I traversed on, on it. It's also a place that is a major inlet into Ikorodu, mm -hmm. right? That um, we've identified a contractor who is going to start um, the major rehabilitation of that road before the end of this month. You know, so Ikorodu is in itself is taken care of. So we've called those ones game changer. It's different from all of the inner routes that we're doing in Ikorodu, and you can test it. You know, so we have about 60 of that all going on. We'll go to another part of the city, Ojokoro. We've just completed 33 roads, you know, um, um, Asan, Macaulay Road, Unity Road. Um, there's another one called um, Prince Something Something Road. 33 of them, Ojokoro, Old Ota Road, connecting to um, AIT and connecting to uh, Abuli Egba. It's a major road that has bridges and all sort of it. People are there working as we speak. How about so, the Lagos Badagri Expressway? Well, Lagos Badagri Express Road. At the risk of telling you how much I've, I've committed to it, it's going on. By the end of this December, they will have gotten to um, the trade fair and beyond. So we're moving it to Okokomaiko. So before we get to Okokomaiko, we're moving it to Iba Junction. Iba Junction is where you have Lasso. And so from there, they'll be going to Okokomaiko. Right. So it's going on. They are working on it. Right. And CCCC, they are fully there. Fully, fully there. What, so it's going on. What about plans for a fourth mainland bridge? I'm sure that has been in conversation are you planning for Okay, this? so if you also monitor, two weeks ago, we advertised Fourth Mainland Bridge. We put it on the advert. You know what has happened with Fourth Mainland Bridge? Two things, right? What's my budget? My total budget for next year is about $3 billion, and that's the biggest in the country, right? Fourth Mainland Bridge, from the design we've seen, is a 37-kilometer road. It's not just Fourth, fourth Mainland Bridge. We want to make it a ring road that will take the back of Ikurudu, come out at Agri Kishawa, and now further take you to Lagos Badagri Express. So just behind your premises here, that's the, that's the whole plan, and it's 37 kilometers. So what have we done? We cannot handle it alone. Let's use private equity. So we've advertised. We've advertised two weeks ago, and we agree internationally, internationally, 
to say that we have the alignment, we have the right of way for the fourth mainland bridge, we have all of the biometric study that we have done, let everybody worldwide, let everybody come and play in it. In our head, we believe it's about a billion, I mean, it's give or take, I'm just, I'm just throwing a number, right? So it's there. D dollars or naira? Oh, it has Definitely. to be, it has, it has, it has to be. So, so, so the fourth mainland bridge, by the grace of God, we should be able to close up on the commercials by the middle of next year. Okay. That's why it's been advertised. So the adverts is closing. The expression of interest is actually ending, um, I think it's next week. Okay. We've given a four weeks um, deadline. It was on five um, newspaper, local and international newspapers. So, and we've gotten a lot of people making inquiries, asking questions. A lot of people are interested. So we do not want to do Fort Milan being at the table or just people that we know. We want the best quality, you know, at the cheapest cost and, and, and at the closest time frame for Lagosians because it's, it's required. But on the back of Fort Milan Bridge is one of the roads that I call the regional road. The regional road is supposed to relieve the Lekki Express Road. So that was why I went on a tour you know, identify the right of way for the regional road. The regional, way is, the regional road is also a road that we want to build on the PPP, right, and be able to make it ready so that when you move traffic on the Lagos Express Road, you have a regional road that will reduce that traffic so that you are not just transferring movement from one part of the city to another part. And like, like I said, like I did observe, right, people that are on that right of way is also another opportunity for them to go and do the needful. Okay. Just go and remove your structure on it before I come and remove the structure. All right. Well, um, Maokwe is in Abuja and she has a question for you. Oh. Maokwe. Good morning, Mr. Governor. Simply looking at uh, responses to some of the things that you have said so far, some of our viewers out there would like to know what is happening with respect to the executive order on um, a papa. They say that the trucks are back, that they were away for a while, perhaps about two weeks and a little more, but it looks like the trucks are back on the Apapa Road. What are your thoughts on it, sir? Well, thank you very much, Maupe. Thank you so very much. And I'm sure Abuja is great this month. Okay, so it's, it's an enforcement that has to be consistent and we have to stay there. So we're working at, with two problems. You know, so federal government also has a tax force that is working and the state government also has a full complement. So with MPA, we're also doing a lot of things. First, we're also trying to see how to provide infrastructure for these trailers. Because if you also don't provide alternatives, they'll keep coming back. So we've identified you know, a trailer park that's going to take 6,000. The investment have been put together and the construction will start in earnest. Part of a challenge that they have in Apapa is also the issue around inside the port itself. The turnaround inside the port, right, brings a lot of clog out on the port, right? I don't want to begin to speak specific about names or about companies that are causing some of these things. That's one. Secondly, and you also go and check, now they need to return empty containers back to the port. So you see a lot of those truck drivers struggling to get back onto the port. There are empty containers, empty, empty containers they are carrying to drop their containers back into the port for demorage. You know, so this is a conversation that we, outside of just solving the traffic, we also need to resolve the operation around the port. So once a, 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 a trailer takes a container outside, right, and you're expecting that that trailer must return that container within 72, or for, I don't know what the time frame is, they need to start counting the clock. So they need to come back on, on that road again and want to come and drop an empty container. And we're saying, no, why don't we have container terminals outside of the port? You know, I don't know how they want to do that outside so that they go somewhere and go and drop the container. Everybody needs no need to come back to the ports to want to come and drop their containers. That's number two. The third one is also, there's, there's, we know we're looking at that bridge, that major bridge, Ijora, you know, going into Apapa, you know, and there's been a lot of load pressure on that bridge, right? And so federal government and ourselves are looking at it and we're saying that maybe we need to take all of these trucks and it's underneath, right? We've seen our, our, our men being attacked, you know, on that road, last month men. We've seen our, 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 our Lagos environmental tax was being attacked, you know, on, on, on that road, but we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop because we're going to continue to put pressure on it. So, but we're working with MPA, we're working with the Shippers Council, we're working with other stakeholders to be able to have a long-lasting solution, like you did observe, 
You know, we've cleared it. Not once, not twice. The bridges have been, have been free. But before you say anything, they are back there. So what causes the back there is because they really cannot enter into the port, either the Tinkan port or the, the Apapa port. And why do they need to get there is because of the empty containers that they need to go and drop. You know, so, so it's, it's a total operation that we need to review, right? But for us as a government, like I said, working with MP and some investor, we're also building, you know, um, a, a very massive trailer um, park for them where we believe that we also can take them, you know, off all of the road, you know, and the redevelopment of the road also happening. You know, the development that is, that is going on is right from the gate of the Apapa port and is all the way on Apapa Osho, the express road. Right, and so that that reconstruction of the road is also going is also going on. Is, is there a time frame for this? I mean, the plans that you have, you've identified the problems. You know that over and over again, you have tried to disperse this people, but they keep coming back owing to the challenges which you've enumerated. But looking at the solutions which you are proffering for the long term, is there a time frame for them? So the long term is this. So let's let's no kid ourselves. The current capacity of the two ports we have has been well outstripped. The current capacity is way, way beyond what they're currently doing. So that's why Lagos had started initiative about the deep lucky port, which is also in conjunction with MPA. So this is one of the reasons why I also went to China to ensure that the investor, which is about a billion dollars, the investors are real and they've started work. That will be the long-term plan. The long-term solution is to decongest that port and have other ports in Lagos being built. So we've started the construction of the Lekki Deep Port. It's to also quickly finalize conversation on the Badagri Port. Those are the long-term solution that will take the city, you know, out of the port. The city in itself has outgrown the two ports that we have. How much which time are we talking about, sir? Well, I mean, the port will be, will be delivered, you know, with all the time that we see in the next two years. It will be, it will be completed. They've said two and a half years where we're pushing ourselves to be able to cut the tape in 24 to 28 months. Okay, now let's quickly take this one. Uh, someone's talking about uh, tank farms in the satellite area. They're saying that it has pushed out the residents of that particular area. The tank farms are taking over. Is this something you consider an environmental menace? Uh, and uh, how are you looking at the residents who are living very close to the tank farms, which ought not to be? Well, I mean, so, so this is it. So, Tank farms have been built. Some of these residents also gave the land for the construction of this tank farm. Let's not deceive ourselves. I mean, so, and that, that Ijegu area supplies about 30 to 35 percent of the total um, uh, PMS, you know, um, usage countrywide. So the, the investment has been there. It's real. There's nothing we can do about that. So about three, four weeks ago, you saw that the whole management of NNPC were with us, were in our office. The whole Tank Farm Association we were together and we've designed a new road. We've designed the Ijegun Egba Road, which is supposed to be a concrete road, right? So, what we're meant to do is to concretize that road and stabilize it. It's going to be a dual carriage road, right? And you'll be able to take out, you know, it is a, it's a critical resource for the country already. The investment that are there is, is massive, you know. So, I'm not going to sit down and say to you that the Tank Farms are going to disappear. No. They supply that, that inlet supplies about 35% of the total national requirement. So one of the things we need to do is to ensure that policing is enforced. And we are stabilizing the roads now. We're stabilizing the road, but we're also working with, like I said, the tank farm owners, with NNPC, and we're going to redevelop the entire um, um, road infrastructure in that whole corridor. We can't do it alone, right? There's investment that we cannot do it alone, and that's the truth. But we'll start down together we know we've, we've all agreed amongst ourselves that all of this needs to happen and needs to happen so very quick. So we've done the design. It's really just for us to sign up. But we're doing palliatives on all of those roads now. And we are the ones doing those palliatives, you know, just so that we don't stop the critical supply of petroleum products, you know, right around the Federation, which is currently happening. You know, now we don't want anything to disturb them. Right. And we have all our security agencies monitoring the, 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 the activity that is going on there. So it's the chicken and egg thing, and we're solving all of the solutions, but it will not be solved overnight. 
Just quickly, if I may, you already referred to slums in the first part of the questioning. Uh, however, there is this one issue which has uh, been going on with the Lagos State Government and Waterfront, uh, the Otodogbame is, um, situation uh, which went to court. And the Lagos State Government was asked to resettle the residents, the, the people who were, uh, had taken over the waterfront. What is the status update with the people of Otodogbame? That's a very specific question, right? I cannot sit down here and tell you what the court have said or what the court has not said, right? But I'm aware of the case. You know, it's on um, around the Freedom Road um, um, in Lekki, right? I'm aware that the, the, the families that were involved, right, there's a settlement with a Leguishi family and all of that is going on. But as into the specifics, as into what the court's position is, you know, I, I, I really, really would not be able to answer that, you know, on a very specific autonomous barrier. But I'm aware of it, I know, and like I said, the, it was a dispute between another family, which is where the Ileguchi, you know, um, royal family is, and um, the, the Ijo, um, Otorubame um, family is there. And so, then court, I mean, but we as a state government are willing to help them resolve it, right? And it's a development that I think even between the two of them, they're talking to each other, but I don't know what the current position is, you know, as we speak or as we sit down here this morning. All right, Mr. Governor, we, we, we are totally out of time. Uh, we could, uh, uh, it would be lovely to take you on, on the economy of Lagos, the private sector, taxation. Well, maybe I could just quickly ask that one. Uh, the, the, the businesses are complaining about uh, multiple taxation in Lagos. Uh, how, how are you taking that? Are you? Are you? It's not true. Which businesses? Which if you ask am Mecca, I, am if you I ask LCCI, if you ask Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, they're going to tell they you are that the they're the best. They're the best team of people we're working with. It's not. It's not true. A lot of the taxes are collected at, at the national level. We don't collect any tax. The only tax they give us is the PAYE. What other tax? If you are doing construction and you need to do normal I mean, tax for the construction we are doing. You will pay the, it's not tax, it will be maybe planning approvals or something that you need to pay for. If you want to do CFO and you have fees to pay for your CFO, you will pay it. We do not have any for. By the way, you know, tax is a legal thing and it's a constitutional thing. So no government can just wake up and say that, you know, they, we, have, we have a viable and a thriving judiciary system. They will take you to court and you, you don't have any point. So, I also, so don't let's even, I mean, well, we, we're going to have to take this. And, and part of the things, you know, that we, we are also trying to do, I actually thought that you were also going to talk about the, the small startups. In the small, so in, the small, in the small startups is for us to see how we encourage the small startups. And that is one of my passion, is the small businesses. And we've said to them that we will work with them. You know, all of the interventions we are doing, Mr. you know, Government. with the Employment Trust Fund and all of it, no tax at all. Mr. Governor, yes, ma. you're going to have to promise that you're going to come back well, so that we can take on the micro, small and medium enterprises, the youth population, the technology, the smart city yeah. that you are, you are very passionate about. But on a parting note, uh, uh, the succession system in Lagos is quite, you know, uh, envied by, you know, many people. And that's why the development progression has been has been on, you know, quite well. But then uh, uh, what's your relationship with um, your predecessors, the uh, Especially the the governor of Lagos, the former governor of Lagos, State, Ashwa, and you know what's the plan? Because the last uh, governor didn't quite have a rosy relationship before he parted ways. You know that's your view. I'm sure. I mean, relationships are things that you continue well, it, it, to. You didn't look like that in the media. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, um, um, you know, relationships are things that you develop and you you evolve. You know, over time, and you continue to nurture right, in and out of government, right? So I, I think I have a perfect working relationship with all of my predecessors. I hold each and every one of them at the highest level. You know, I, I have tremendous respect for each and every one of them. They are people that have laid the foundation for what I'm sitting on today. And you know, we just lost, you know, an elder statesman who started the foundation of Lagos, late General Mobalaji Johnson. And you can see the, the state government gave him, you know, a befitting, you know, um, um, burial. But in all of it, everybody that has passed through Lagos, I tend to have a, 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 a fairly, you know, decent relationship for them. And I, and I respect each and every one of okay. them. That one passion that you have, you know, for, especially for youth and technology, we'll close with that when we come back from this break. Okay. Please stay with us.
a concluding moment, and definitely we don't have enough time, but there's a quick question that... I oh, was... definitely. I mean, if you look on social media, people have been talking about the NURTW, Agbe Rosa, and I'd like you to respond to that. A lot of people say on the roads they're being harassed on a daily basis. In fact, the user said they have literally taken over, you know, the garages and, and all that. So what are you doing about it? Well, okay, so let's, let's put it in context, right? Um, um, NURTW, it's, I, I met them, it's a, a labor union that has a national um, um, coverage. In fact, the national president of NURTW is, is a northerner, right? So, like you said, it's Nigerian union of, it's, it's a labor union. So it's, it is a registered union organization. What about the Agbero component? Are no, they well, no, so, so, it, 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 so it, it will now be the subset of it. So how are they managing their people, right? Agbero is, is like when you said Okada, you know, and people use different names, you know, to, 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 to express them. Agbero in itself, if you understand the literary translation, you know, of Nigeria, are conductors. You understand? Yeah. So, but that is not to take away the point of what you are trying to achieve or what you are trying to ask me. What you are trying to ask me, what is the state government doing to be able to regulate them? So like any other union, right, they are under our ambit to regulate them, okay. right? And even in their leadership, you know, we call them and we say to them that if you don't leave or comport yourself or are under the law that sets okay. you up, you also can be proscribed, okay. right? Security is critical for us, you know, safety is critical for us. Law and order is critical for us, okay. right? But because their numbers are huge, that's where you see a whole lot of them. And we say to them, brand yourself. Let people know who exactly you are, right? So it's not something that I'm going to sit and say to you that they do not exist. Like I said, it's a trade union. Okay. On a final note, yes, we sir. recently heard that the states will not repeal the Pensions Act, and that has been making the news. So on one hand, what is your stance concerning, you know, state governors, ex-governors getting pensions? And do you think the state can afford it? From what we have seen in the news, it seems huge. Well, I mean, it, it, would, be, it would be, imagine and I'm adjudicating on my own case, <laughs> right? That would be very presumptuous of me, right? Because in and out, either I'm a beneficiary or not a beneficiary, and I think it's unfair for me to take a position on that. And like you said, we said, it's a, it's the legal state, is a law of the legal state House of Assembly. It has nothing to do with me, it's been there. And so if, if they want to take it on, they want to repeal it, it's a, national, it's a state house of assembly that have, you know, the rules of the engagement are very clear, right? So they can repeal, it's their law. They can repeal their law as the case may be and deal with it, right? But as per affordability and can, can they, you know, um, can, can we afford it or can stop it? It depends, you know, different people have, you know, where they put their priorities, right? I just approved, you know, a compensation higher than the federal government compensation. I just approve a 35,000 compensation, and federal government says theirs is 30,000. I feel the pain of my people. I understand, you know, the level of living in Lagos. And I said to myself that if these are still the same civil service that I'm going to use to push on my economic agenda, I need to put them in the right pedestal where they understand and appreciate that they are critical to me. You know, everybody says that my people are my greatest asset. I just don't want to talk it. I want them to reflect it. Okay. So that's why I'm doing that for them. So regarding pension, if I leave, if I, I cannot make a, a judgment call on that. All right. Well, Mr. Babaji Desanwolu, Governor of Lagos State, thank you so much thank for you. your time in all of your busy schedule. Thank you.